Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 147, verses 1 through 20. You can find that and follow along in your pew Bibles on page 582 in the Old Testament. It's a little bit long compared to some of the songs that we've done. It's 20 verses, so instead of reading the whole thing up front, I'm going to intersperse the reading of the psalm uh, with the sermon itself commenting as we go. So just keep your, keep your Bibles open to that page, and uh, as we prepare to hear God's word for us this morning, let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A long time ago, back in the days of the circuit riding preacher, that's a preacher who would ride on horseback across the plains on the frontier to preach at several different churches each Sunday. Back in those days, a certain preacher wanted to train his horse. And being a preacher, he thought it would be clever to use biblical phrases and commands. So he taught the horse to giddy up and go whenever he said the phrase, praise the Lord. And then he taught his horse to stop whenever he said the word hallelujah. And that worked out great. It really impressed the people when he rode into town on his horse shouting hallelujah and bringing his horse to a complete stop. And then after the service was over, he would mount up on his horse as the people gathered on the front steps of the church and he would shout praise the Lord and the horse and rider would gallop off into the horizon. Well, one day in between towns, the preacher fell asleep in the saddle. And when he woke up, he found that his horse had veered off course and was headed at a fast trot straight towards the edge of a cliff. Flustered, he tried really hard to remember which command it was that made the horse stop. He shouted, jubilation and God Almighty and transubstantiation, but nothing worked. Just as the horse was about to go right over the edge of the cliff, he remembered and cried out, hallelujah! and the horse came to an abrupt stop two inches from certain death. Wiping the sweat from his brow, the preacher breathed a sigh of relief and said, Phew, that was close, but we made it, praise the Lord. He was never heard from again. <laughs> Hallelujah is simply a Hebrew word that when translated literally means praise the Lord. It is the very first word at the beginning of Psalm 147, and it's the very last word as well. In fact, the last five psalms of the book of Psalms all begin and end with the word hallelujah, or praise the Lord. And so these last five psalms are known as the Hillel, or praise psalms. I think it's fitting that today we are ending our annual summer sermon series on the Psalms with one of the very last Psalms, the third from the end, in fact. So let's jump right in with verse 1. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. Wait a minute, God. The past year was really tough. I mean, I can think of more reasons to be angry with you, God, than to praise you right now. Why is a song of praise fitting when everything in my life and in my world are so messed up right now? That's a great question. It's not a new question. In fact, it would have been very familiar to the people of ancient Jerusalem around the time when this psalm would have been written. In the year 587 B.C., 
the Babylonian army invaded the city of Jerusalem, breaking through its walls, raising all of its buildings to the ground. Entire families were slaughtered, and those few who survived were carted away into slavery in a foreign land. With their sacred temple destroyed, singing praises to God probably didn't seem fitting to them, or even an option at least not in any familiar or recognizable way. Now, 70 years later, after a regime change in Babylon, a remnant of those exiles were finally allowed to return and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, its homes, its walls, and its temple. And Psalm 147, today's psalm, reflects that beginning in verse 2 and recognizes that event. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Why do we praise the Lord in bad years as well as good ones? Because we recognize and we trust his ultimate trajectory. That even when all that we love and hold dear is lost, God still has a plan and a future for us. And we see that pattern repeated over and over and over throughout the scriptures, throughout the story of God's relationship with us, his people. Broken hearts heal in time and old wounds give way to new horizons. Verse 4. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. I think somebody left the phone up there. Okay, thanks Rusty. I think that when the psalmist speaks of the stars in the sky, every single one of them named and numbered and remembered, I think that's also a poetic way of saying that God remembers all of his children, all of his stars, those whom we have lost as well as those who are still yet to come. And we, in our limited and finite wisdom, may never completely understand why it is that people come and go into our lives in the blink of an eye. But it's enough. It's enough just to know that whatever that answer may be, we are in God's just and capable hands. In the next section of the psalm, having now addressed the sorrow and the loss of the people, the psalmist calls them once more to praise. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. But wait a minute, God. What exactly is it that we have to be thankful for? You see, we're starting from scratch all over again here. We haven't rebuilt anything yet, and our city, our temple, our homes, our lives are just a pale shadow of what they used to be. How are we supposed to be thankful for that? I think it's funny how we tend to measure our success and therefore our gratitude in terms of the things that we build or we achieve. We build houses, we build cars, skyscrapers, families, careers, empires, 401k plans, and we so often fall into the trap of thinking that these are the only things to be proud of and thus thankful for. But Psalm 147 points us to simpler things, things over which we have absolutely no control. Verse 8, he covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food 
and to the young ravens when they cry. For what it's worth, the raven is absolutely my favorite bird, partly because they show up in just about every mythology, every sacred text, and every major world religion. And in a lot of those texts, ravens, which are very intelligent birds, sometimes represented as crafty or cunning, they usually represent or are compared to human beings. And I think here in the psalm is no exception. Jesus in Luke 12 says, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet, God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than these birds? I think Jesus' point, and the point of the psalmist too, is that God doesn't really care what you build, how hard you have worked, how much you have saved at the end of the day or at the end of your life. God is still going to make the rain fall and make the grass grow for everyone. He's still going to provide the basis of life and nourishment every day. And so give thanks too for these things. The psalmist continues in verse 10. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Once again, the things that we use to establish value are not necessarily the things that are the most important to God. We care a lot about strength and speed, among other things. But according to Psalm 147, God cares about people and relationships, about reverence and hope and love. And so give thanks for these things too. In the final section of the psalm, the psalmist calls the people to praise for yet a third time. But this time the call is wider. It's to the entire city. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. And what you see here is that even as the people of Jerusalem are beginning to rebuild, there is a good and necessary sense of collaboration between God and God's people. We build gates, but God strengthens them. We produce children, but God blesses them. We establish borders, but it is God who makes peace within them. We plant the wheat, but it is God who makes the harvest plentiful. If you are building or rebuilding your life after a difficult season, have you invited God into that process? In the next verses, the psalmist returns to the imagery of nature. Verse 15. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. There's a lot of chaos in these verses. God sends snow, but then scatters it. God sends hail, but then melts it. God sends the winds and the waters. And after this past week, I think most of us can kind of identify with the chaos that the winds and waters are capable of creating. But here's the thing. Chaos and unpredictability are simply a part of life in this world. God never promises to us that the weather, or any other circumstances for that matter, will always be to our liking, or even for our benefit. 
You see, life is full of ups and downs, joy and sorrow, triumph and tragedy, and we have the ability to choose to seek the beauty in all of those things. On the other hand, if we center our gratitude and our thankfulness around the events of the day or the month or the year, then we are no better than tumbleweeds blown around in the wind, changing our mood and our gratitude with every day and every little thing. But there is something far more stable, far more enduring and lasting for us to anchor our hope to, for us to center our gratitude and our lives upon. Verse 19, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. In the same way that the name Jacob is a poetic synonym for Israel, statutes and ordinances are a synonym for God's word, for the Bible, the scriptures, God's teaching, and the lifelong wisdom that studying that teaching conveys. In the time of the psalmist, this wisdom was given specifically to the people of Israel. But in the millennia that have followed, God's word has found its way to all nations and all peoples. There is a good reason why the Bible is and remains the number one best-selling book of all time in any language. And there is a good reason that the Psalms Psalms like this one, written 3,000 years ago, half a world away from us, in a completely different culture, still have the power to connect with us and inspire us and speak powerfully to our hearts and to our situations. Psalms give us hope and confidence that we too, just like the people of ancient Jerusalem, we can start over again rebuilding our lives and our communities on the ruins of yesterday and yesteryear. We too can take joy in the simple things, all of the things that change and all of the things that never change. To paraphrase a man I didn't know but whom I admire greatly, a Texas lawyer named Zolly Stakely, we too can look up at the moon and then appreciate what God gives us here on earth and be grateful for the beautiful things he provides for us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we know that you give wonderful things in this world, in this life. And we know that sometimes you take things away sooner than we would like. Lord, help us to see the beauty in all things, even when we can't understand why they happen or how they work. Help us to seek out that beauty, that simplicity, Help us to see in the face of every person we meet your image. And help us to love those around us, those in our world, and the life that you have given to us each day. We pray all of these things just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.